to do a little live video since we're all quarantined. I have more time on my hands. I'm not going to do these every day or anything like that, but probably a little bit more often than I have. Um, if you look, I uploaded a video earlier today on the Trayvon Martin uh, hoax, which is a pretty interesting book on that case. But uh, for this, I just want to start kind of a general discussion on, and this is some. It's not going to be declarative. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how this is going to play out. There's a lot of ifs and thens and maybe shoulda, wouldas. Um, but what is... People, this coronavirus situation is very interesting, right? We haven't had something like this in a very long time. The last time that there was a pandemic that was really like this was probably the, um, the Spanish flu. Spanish flu is probably going to end up having had a larger death rate. We don't know for sure what the death rate is with this, but probably larger. But we have a larger population now, and it's going to be uh, more traumatic. The other thing is that happened in 1919, 1920, and we really were just in the early stages of modern medicine. Penicillin had just been invented. Uh, we didn't really have any virology, and we just, you know, all through human history, we've been suffering pandemics. You know, if you think that this is bad, let's say it's as the worst. Uh, let's say let's say one uh, percent, uh, or let's say five percent of the people die from this. That and that would be you know hugely terrible. But you know, when the when the Europeans came to Native America, the Native Americans had. I mean, the estimates do vary, but like at least if we at least fifty percent uh, died in pandemics, at least. And by some estimates, and probably in some circumstances, it was as high as 90%. And it wasn't just the Native Americans. If you go back in history, this happened over and over and over and over again. We all, we've all heard about the Black Death. Ugh. There's no one here for me to cough on, Mark. Uh, so, you know, for us having a 1%, 2 3% death rate, that seems like a huge deal to us. And it is from our perspective, and I'm not trying to mit mitigate it, but... We've had much, much worse pandemics in the past. And it used to be, you know, all through the 19th, uh, 19th century, you would have typhoid epidemics, you'd have cholera epidemics, where they would go through and kill a, a huge, and this is not just the Native Americans, this is, you know, the Anglo population. So uh, we're just getting like a little taste of what it was like throughout all of human history, at least from the Neolithic, when, when the end of hunter-gatherers, right, when we were hunter-gatherers and we didn't have domesticated animals, it's from domesticated animals that we get a lot, the lion's share of our diseases, uh, and uh, which is probably what happened in this case. I think they know for sure it had. Well, you might can not consider bats or pangolins domesticated, but they were being held by the Chinese and used for food. So, same situation. But hunter gatherer days, pandemics like this were probably pretty rare, and it was hard for them to spread because people weren't living in confined spaces and having too much interaction with each other or to, with a wide group of people. Once you started getting settled communities and cities, this has just become a thing. And we've had, I mean, the Black Plague is really well attested, but there's pretty good evidence that plagues like that or on that level were pretty recurrent. You know, the Antonine Plague and so forth. So that but that's, that was over 100 years ago. So we've had 100 years. The only one that would be even remotely close would be the HIV epidemic, which, uh, as terrible it is, and it's a more lethal disease, it's much more dangerous disease uh, if, if you catch it than is the coronavirus, but it's also not very easy to spread uh, and it, unless you do engage in high-risk beha behaviors are extraordinarily unlucky. It's just not something that you need to really fear. Um, when I was reading about it, one of the things that was so terrifying about it though is we've always had deadly diseases, right? So, and uh, cancers, um, but most of the disease after World War II, we had basically treatments for most or all contagious diseases, especially uh, STDs. So, you know, syphilis was this horrible curse. Syphilis was, a, was uh, you know, one of the most traumatic uh, uh, diseases to get in the 19th century. And a lot of people at the turn of the century were really obsessed with it. But after World War II, we had treatments for it and gonorrhea and, con and chlamydia and polio and all these other things. And then HIV came around and it was a deadly disease, you know, a very deadly disease, and it was contagious and that freaked people out. But it didn't spread very easily and it only spread among a relatively small segment of the population. So within gay circles, I think I think gay people who live through the HIV epidemic uh, is like, 
they might have a better idea what this is like. Um, but for most people, it's very traumatic. It's a big deal. The number of people who are going to die sounds like it's going to be very large. Uh, the the government's response has been all over the place. And so the question becomes, you know, what is this going to be? And, and I feel like a lot of people are just engaging in confirmation bias. Okay, so a lot of people, whatever their political ideo ideology was before, are just say, feeling vindicated. You know, so Jimmy Dore believes that socialism has been vindicated because, quote, capitalism has failed. I don't know what socialist system is going to resist the coronavirus. Okay, so China is getting ravaged by this. Russia is getting ravaged by this, although they're not talking about it. And I don't know that uh, having met, we can have we can have an NHS, we can have Health Canada, we can have Scandinavian socialism or whatever other system they have. National health care in Italy, for instance, it's not really going to be a protective measure against this. And I did a video uh, about free market and healthcare just a couple of days ago, where I just outlined all the all the ways in which we don't a do not have a free market in healthcare, and b why those ways are making this disaster much worse. There's also a thing where the federal government has clearly made so many mistakes when it comes to this at first telling people uh not to worry it's not a big deal just wash your hands we've now had all these allegations of basically insider trading where high-powered senators on both sides of the party including diane feinstein and i hope this ends her career please um uh knew this was coming and started short selling and telling their high-paid vip sponsors to you know prepare for the worst but then putting on a happy face for everybody else uh, which gives you a good idea of their motives, right? If they, these are really beneficent people who are motivated primarily for the public good and for helping other people. There might be an argument for not try, wanting to cause panic, but there are ways to address the situation without causing panic, or at least attempting to, and to just be self completely selfish, which is what all of them behaved like. Um, I mean, if that's the behavior, I don't know how you can have a government that you where you acknowledge that's you want people like that to be in power to have control trump has been all over the place uh i think that he's not doing any worse than anyone else would have done uh you know they say he he waited too long he declared a national emergency at the time when we had one corona death uh, that we knew of anyway there are probably other ones that we don't know about um it took obama a thousand deaths of sars before he declared that so you know, just to, to compare the two, uh, you know, in hindsight, you could say you should have shut down all the airports much sooner, whatever not. But I don't want to defend him because he's, he's incredibly narcissistic about the whole thing. Oh, I, I know this very well. The doctors complimented me, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, he's saying this reiterates his plan, his, his previous proposal. So um, it's just interesting because there's a lot of things that we wouldn't expect. So one thing that's happened is that every public school in America, basically, I think it's very likely true, or it will be soon if it's not already, is empty. All of them. And the universities are empty. Now, John Taylor Gatto and his wildest dreams could never envision that happening. Now, sure, most of them are being asked to take part in some kind of online classes, but the infrastructure for that has not been set up, and it's not really going very smoothly. This has been hugely jarring for everybody, uh, and all those quote kids are home now or at least they're not in school I'm sure a lot of them aren't home they're off co coughing on um, you know uh, uh, produce at the store and putting on their on their Instagram so uh, it's that's incredible because they're basically free I mean they could they could be taking an online class but we all know that they're not doing that that they're on their Facebook that they're, well they don't do Facebook anymore but they're um, going online they're going outside they're doing and this is for college and high school and I think a lot of these people are going to ask serious questions on why are we required to go to school why are we required to pay for the buildings to pay for the teachers to pay for the janitorial staff to pay for the administration why is all that necessary when apparently this can be done from home at what would presumably be a fraction of the cost and I think a lot of people are going to say I just like this convenience a lot of families, it's, this is stressing out a lot of families because they got to take care of their kids now. But And some of them are going to resent it and be very happy when the schools come back. And some of them are going to think, you know what, I actually liked being with my kids. I actually liked that they were home. I liked being able to keep track of them. I liked being able to have that influence that I didn't have when I was sending them to the, to the public schools. So some of those people, I mean, if you were already homeschooling, 
none of those people are going to decide, oh, we're going to start going to public school now. None of them. Some proportion of the people who are from the public schools are going to decide, you know what, why are we, what are, they're either not going to go or they're going to have reservations about it. A lot of people in college are going to ask serious questions like, why am I paying for room and board? Why am I paying for a dorm? Why am I paying for a meal plan that's overly expensive? Uh, why am I buying all these books when apparently I can do this from home from anywhere in the country? These are questions that basically all of them, if they didn't ask before, are asking now, and they're asking now with a real motivation behind it. This is just, and, and even if they are taking online classes, just the fact that they are not there in the school being, I mean, the, even if you're quarantined in your house, you are in many ways more free than if you are in a classroom with a teacher looking over your back. So that was just, you know, who would have dreamed that that would happen, but that's happened. And that's going to be for this year. It may even be for next year. It depends how this goes. You know, we'll see. There's a lot of contingencies on how this plays out. Um, another thing has been guns. Guns have just, everyone's buying guns. It's just, obviously, the police are saying we're not going to, um, uh, <laughs> people are not going to. You know, the cops are saying we're going to reduce, uh, A, they're like emptying the prisons, which isn't another, uh, you know, thing. And they're not em emptying them completely and it's not happening everywhere. But they're just saying, okay, th these are dangerous. We can't take care of you. Be gone. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of those people are guilty of nonviolent crimes and I'm glad that they're out. Although I do wonder about, you know, do they have a place to go or whatnot? Um, are they going to become, if they are actually criminals, are they going to turn to crime? That could be a bad thing. But... <coughs> People are arming themselves. Gun stores sold out. Ammo sold out. So, uh, you know, that's a good thing. You know, and I think a lot of people, a lot of people are noticing that. And not many people are, you don't see the Brady campaign coming out. Maybe I should check and see, but I haven't heard any stories about them bitching about this and saying, oh my God. Why are we allowing this? We should try and pass gun control out, right? Nobody's saying this is an, uh, uh, well, I do think that there are some like municipal authorities who are talking along those lines. Um, so he coughed, burn at the stake. All right, calm down people. I cough everything. When I talk a lot, I cough. Um, so there's that. The other thing, well, there's, there's a couple taxes, man. Uh, tax day got postponed. Uh, if they do um, a payout, if they just call it a tax rebate, I mean, people aren't going to complain. I pay a lot of taxes. If they if they write me a check to give me some of that back, even though I understand that that will be inflated away very quickly, we are in very dangerous stagflation, right? If they if they they've been inflating this entire time, but as long as people keep working, there's a lot being produced. Then you don't actually see that much of a price increase. Uh, people are buying and they're they're taking their money and they're spending it on all kinds of things, right? All kinds of goods. Um, well, you can't spend it on all kinds of goods. If you get a check uh, in four weeks or next month for $3,000 or $1,000, you're going to buy food with it. So guess what? The price of food's going to... And if they set price controls, that food's going to be gone or it's going to be black market time, baby, all, all day long, right? Because people are not going to spend it on cruises. They're not going to spend it on boom boxes. They're not going to spend it on... They're going to spend it on guns if they can. They're going to spend it on food. And you're going to see a massive price inflation uh, from that. So, which is going to wake up a lot of people up too, I think. So, um, but if they just call it a tax rebate, hey, we're giving the money back that we fucking took from you anyway. In my case, I mean, I just wrote them a check and it cleared not like just a couple days before this really broke. And if they pay me back, even if it's inflated, I'd rather take the inflated dollars back than zero of them. So, um, People are also learning that they have to have a gun in case something happens. Yeah, ultimately you are responsible for yourself. It's the same with the stopping the spread. If you want to stop the spread of the virus or you don't want to catch the virus, if you don't want to catch the virus and you think, well, it's fine, government will take care of me, you know, you're going to catch the virus then. If you don't want to catch it, that's on you. You've got to find a way to make that happen. It's only your diligence that will make that happen, and it's only your diligence that will stop it from spreading. No amount of police state is going to end that. And the other thing is, yes, if you want to defend yourself, if you want to feed yourself, that's on you. They're not going to do it for you. If you if you want to trust to them doing that, that's that's lunacy. So 
Yeah. Now, I'm not saying this believing that all the solutions would... Oh, and the other thing, massive deregulation of the medical field. I just heard the FDA is not going to be regulating any company that makes hand sanitizer. So I, don't, I feel like every, every company should just start making hand sanitizer and say, don't regulate us. They're drastically cutting back regulations. A, a big part of the problem is here, the FDA prevented testing for six weeks because even though there were tests that existed, they were like, well, we want to develop our own test that is more sophisticated. And because it's a declared pandemic, we have a monopoly on this, right? So if it wasn't a declared pandemic, private institutions could develop and use their own tests. But because it was a declared pandemic, they couldn't. They had to get permission from the uh, FDA and the CDC. CDC is kind of a subunit of the FDA, apparently. Um, and they just denied doing this for six weeks. That's why even though South Korea and the United States had the first recorded case of coronavirus on the same day, which I think was January 21st, South Koreans went full balls into, into doing massive testing, and they've done a ton, and they've, that's been very helpful in, in stemming the growth. We waited six weeks as the FDA tried to develop their own special test, and this is very akin to what they do with drugs generally. Oh, you have a drug that works? Well, you have to go through 10 years and a billion dollars, otherwise it's not good enough for the FDA. Well, and if 100,000 people die in the interim who could be treated with that drug, that I mean, who really cares? And hundreds of thousands of Americans could die as a result of that one six-week delay. Just that one. There's no way that they've prevented that many deaths in their entire history. If you counted all of them up, no way. Just that one. They've probably killed hundreds of thousands of people per year anyway, or at least tens of thousands per year. I've heard varying estimates. It's hard to estimate, but there, there are estimates that put it in the millions. There are people who claim, based on sound estimates, that the FDA has killed more people than the Department of Defense, uh, just because of the nature of the, the, the aggregate of all the numbers involved. But uh, So there's massive deregulation there, and I think a lot of people are going to be fair to ask, why are we putting it in the hands of these massive bureaucracies when they're just going to drop the ball and why the politician, I mean, you have the technocratic bureaucracies that are intent on their own propagation and their own power and their own control. So they don't look at it like what's best for the country. They like that. What's best for the EPA? What's best for the CDC? That's what they care about. And if, and if giving them a monopoly, they would just love, I mean, their labs say we want to do these tests. They would contact the FDA and the C CDC and the CDC would say, you may apply to become an affiliate organization and like we have a test right now we have patients we want to test and like you may apply and then they would get a reply like four weeks later so um there's that there's other issues that i don't think are strictly libertarian that have also just kind of um changed overnight immigration uh uh economic autarky so you have a lot more um i mean nobody's saying we should have open borders now joe biden all the media criticized Trump for stopping airlines from China and called it xenophobic. Um, but they're not saying that now. They're not saying that we should have the airline ban. Every country in the world that Canada has done that. Is Justin Trudeau xenophobic? Does he have Americophobia? No. Right. So the idea that we should have open borders, I think that is just politically dead for a while now. Even though it wasn't Mexicans bringing it over earlier, it was Chinese. Um, I mean, I'm not blaming Chinese people for where it was coming from. But, uh, and the same with, uh, no, I would love, I, I don't think this is going to turn out the way that I would, I like, if they want to bring manufacturing back to the United States, the best way to do that is just say, okay, no taxes, no regulations, and they will come back here tomorrow, because it'll save them on shipping costs, right? They're not going to do that, I don't think, and they'll probably use some kind of, you know, protectionist mercantilism to do that, which is the wrong way to do it. Um, but I will just note that's a huge change in the political um, sphere, right? Not necessarily one I agree with, by the way, but it, it is a change that just kind of happened. Um, blah, blah, blah. People are learning that they should have a gun and kick, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Not my president, three seconds later free one thousand dollars it's not it is going to be highly inflationary though again since nobody's where very a lot of people are still working but way fewer people are and if you're in, if you're interested in the history 
What really killed it in the Weimar Republic is you had a large portion of the population that was not working. So the specific history there, Germany was making payments, uh, reparation payments after World War I to the French and the English. Um, and they were always haggling over the amount and then re trying to renegotiate the loans and whatnot because they were borrowing money from, you know, from Morgan Stanley uh, in the United States to help pay back the loans. Uh, and at one point they stopped doing repayments, so the French basically occupied a big part of West Germany, the Ruhr, the Rhineland, the area that was a big industrial part of Germany. And they said, we're just going to expropriate the, uh, what's the stuff that's built here. Uh, and so all the workers there went on strike. They stopped working so that there wouldn't be any, you know, factory goods, any coal, any steel that would go to the French. And that was great for about a week. And then those people were like, hey, we got to eat. We don't have any income. So the Weimar Republic said, you know, you're helping us. You're be being in solidarity with other German people. We want to help you. So we will continue to pay you. We will continue to pay you. Uh, and so they did, but they weren't working. And this was the start and ended up becoming the whole process of the hyperinflation. A really good book on that for anyone interested is When Money Dies. Uh, and I am worried that that is the setup that we're going towards right now. Now, I don't know if it will be that bad or if it will have exa exactly the same course. We're in a different situation for a number of reasons. But that's one more variable that is similar with that past. Let's see. I already got my food and TPL would be buying a quantity. So I was actually making room for my my freezer. Uh, and uh, I actually found a full chem suit and a gas mask from 1983 that was unopened, that was had been packaged back in May of 1983. It still had the labels on it that I had bought back in my prepper days, oh, at this point, probably 10, 15 years ago. And I still had it. I tried it on. It fits. It's great. So like I have a full cum suit and I have at least two gas masks. I have another one laying around someplace else. But uh, I thought, oh, how appropriate that I have this. Never, never make fun of a prepper. And that's another thing. A lot more people are going to become preppers after this, to some degree. Is everyone going to have a ranch out in the woods with a moat? Probably not. But all that stuff it sounds it sounded funny. A lot of people fled. You know, I'm on my grinder here in New Hampshire. A lot of guys appeared that I'd never seen before, and they're like. I'm from New York City, I'm from Boston, and I got out of Dodge, I left. You know, uh, they found friends, they found family, and they left. Okay, somebody who's doing like that is not trusting that Bill de Blasio is going to take care of them. Do you think agorism will become more prevalent? I've been thinking this for a long time, and maybe... Yeah, so that's definitely happening right now. People are going to stores and saying, what time do you get deliveries? When do you let people in? What do I need to do on the side? If they ever do a lockdown, which they have already done in some places, uh, if they do a lockdown, obviously there'll be enormous amounts of corruption with the police. If you're not allowed to leave your house, but you need food, you and you have money or you have something else to trade, you will find somebody else who can. It seems likely that certain workers will be designated, you know, essential laborers, whether they be cops or uh, people who sock the food shelves or whatnot. And if they get some kind of pass where they're allowed to go to and from, then everybody they know is going to come to them and be like, here's $100, please go and buy me, I need this, this, and this. And, you know, some of those people are going to be nice and just not charge anything, and some of those people are going to be scalpers. There's going to be a ton of that that's going to be going on. And yes, if you've got a farm, if you've got access to the goods, you're going to be selling under the table all the time. Those people are, they are they're telling you the price. It's a seller's market on all that stuff. It, and so uh, there's a ton of, that's always been a lot of that going on. It's going to be much more now. Uh, yeah, black markets will pro pro proliferate as regulations, inflation, taxes increase, but that will forestall the collapse. Yeah, it'll keep people fed. Black markets get people with things what they need, even if the law is stopping them. Uh, it's impossible to conceive of the tens of thousands of drugs that might exist without the FDA in their effect. Yeah, we don't know. And again, as I said in that previous video, I'm not saying that they would have invented a career for coronavirus before it happened. They didn't know it was going to happen. But some of those drugs might help. You know, um, People are talking about this chloroquine that already existed, where there might be 10 other drugs like chloroquine that might work better or in combination. And the thing is, they're just not available. And they're also very expensive. And also, the number of companies that can... That, in order to meet the hurdles of the FDA, there's only if you have to have an enormous amount of capital, and so there's a limit to how many there are. It's the big three. Let's say it's big pharma. There isn't big pharma 
and medium pharma and small small pharma. There's just big pharma. And I don't even know how many companies there are, but let's say there's 10. If we didn't have an FDA, there could be 100 big pharma companies, and then there could be 1,000 medium-sized companies and 10,000 small companies. And granted, a lot of them would be unlikely to find a treatment or whatever, but all of them competing with each other, all of them trying to find different ways and innovative ways, and some of those ways would fail, some of them would not. We would have so many more options. It's just ridiculous that we've, we've really you know put all of our chips into one one basket here and that's not what you want. You don't want that for anything really. Uh, do you think Vegeta is circumcised? No, of course the knife would break. There's nothing that they have could, could cut his skin. Jeffrey Tucker just tweeted out today that open borders don't proliferate pandemics. Well, so, okay. I think pandemics are a very interesting thing to talk about independent of themselves. I think that in a lot of ways they are apolitical. Um, so obviously if, if you don't have any disease in your in your area and you shut the borders and you do that effectively, you can stop it from getting there. But stopping at 100% seems really difficult. Uh, and once it gets within your society, it's very hard to stop the spread, especially with something like this. I am leaning towards that this, as serious as this is, and it is serious, the large majority of people don't actually get that sick, which means, you know, when they find the first case, when you, when we find the first case, like, like in China, the first, the first patient zero or whatever, um, was, uh, third week of November. Well, chances are very unlikely that's the guy who got the virus from the bat. What probably happened is somebody got the virus from the bat. They either didn't get sick at all or they got mildly sick, but not enough to go to the hospital. And they spread it to person, to person, to person, to person, to person. And to person, and they started spreading it, and they started spreading it. And at some point, in the first hundred people or the first thousand people, one of them started to get sick, and a couple days later, when it had already been spread to a couple thousand other people, they went to the hospital, and their patient zero. So when we have the first case in the United States, which was in Washington State, assuming that nobody else, and there's, it's very possible that other people have come and started spreading it, right? So it really is very hard to close borders or not. Like Russia closed their borders, and they're not, they're saying they have few cases, but there's evidence that they actually are having a, a pandemic in Russia as well. That they're just denied. If you look at the Chinese, I saw this graph that showed the Chinese new cases are shooting up and then flat because they just said they have no new cases. Right. Okay. Okay, China. Um, right. They say they are saying they have no cases from uh, uh, domestic uh, contagion, that they're foreigners coming in. That's why they wanted to call it the Italian flu or the U.S. Army flu. Um, so, you know, I think whatever you want to say about open borders and there's many of really meritorious things you can say about open borders the idea that they don't spread pandem pandemics though is i think incorrect um now that also doesn't mean that closing the borders even completely will stop that from happening uh howdy from anchorage how is it in anchorage got my polish gas mask preppers only need to be right once yeah, I, I actually people call, talk about Pascal's wager with God. Oh, you know, what if, um, you know, uh, you, you don't you want to assume that God's right so you can go to even if there's a, only a one in a million chance, but you'd rather take that to go to heaven than to go to hell or whatever. It's it's much better. Like the odds are actually much better because a the likelihood that something bad has happened is is not that low. B it's not like religion where, well, which God do I pick? Should I pray to Zeus or Thor? Or should I be, you know, should I be a Muslim? Should I be Jewish? You know, with, with prepping, you just kind of know, I need to be able to take care of myself. I need to uh, satisfy my bodily needs or whatever other needs you want to list in the event that um, there's some kind of breakdown in the, um, in, in the chain of production. So store food, supplies, energy, right? There's levels to it. You can get to the point where you have your own, you're totally off the grid. You have your own power, your own water, your own defense, your own food. You can make your own food, blah, blah, blah. You have storage, you know, and you can take it that far. 
I, th I feel like a lot of people though are, are kind of wiki about this where they think I got I have two weeks of food I'm good I'm like what the two weeks what are you <laughs> you know I got two weeks of food and I've got the I've got a rolled up newspaper or a baseball bat huh <laughs> okay um, yeah the majority of us will get it it's just when and what burden on the healthcare system I think it is true I do think most people are not going to get sick but it doesn't matter if 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 half of us get it that's 150 million people and if 1% of them need to go to the hospital that's you know one and a half million people that's right there more than we have beds uh, hospital beds and not only is it just that then it becomes a compound problem because if it's full of you say well we have just enough to cover coronavirus yeah but what about the cancer patients and what about the people who break their arms and what about the people who right so it it is, I, I do think it is actually very, very serious, even though most people are not going to get that sick. Most people won't need to be hospitalized. And I do, th I said 1%. It sounds like it's more than that. They'll end up being hospitalized, though. It sounds like it's more like 20%, maybe, potentially. Uh, so if it's 20%, then that's 15 million people. Well, you know, we are, if it's 15 million people that go to the hospital, dude, uh, 14 million, 900,000 of those people are screwed. Right, I mean they, they, that doesn't mean that they will die, all of them, but they, they're screwed. They won't get one-on-one -on -one medical treatment. So, I do think that it is serious, even if most people aren't going to be that sick. Enough per, enough percentage are apparently. We don't know the full numbers here, but it seems likely that it's in that range. Uh, I just found it funny how. Open border libertarians like Tucker will defend open borders at a time like this. Well, you get, give credit for principle. I mean, I remember when 9-11 happened, Harry Brown came out and said, this is, we, you know, we basically asked for this. Our foreign policy made this inevitable. Uh, he came out with a piece on that on September 12th. And that was, I thought that was very brave of him. So the open borders, I don't feel as strongly one way or another on open borders as I did against U.S. foreign policy before 9-11. I think that was pretty obviously true. Um... Uh, I think open borders are more debatable. I, I do tend to fall on the open borders side. Uh, but, I mean, to say to say that they wouldn't help... And also the question is, should everything be geared towards stopping a pandemic? Right? This is going to be a once-in-a-century thing, so should our entire infrastructure and our entire ge uh, geopolitics be based on this one event? Um, it's not technically a black swan event because these are guaranteed to happen. But what are we going to impoverish ourselves for a hundred years so that we're ready for the next one? And it's not likely that we'll keep the vigilance in a hundred. The, the thing that's most likely going to help is innovation, uh, proliferation of technology, wealth. You know, if if everybody had enough money that they could stock themselves and they could go for six months without working and never have to leave the house because they have everything that they need, this would be a lot better. That's hard to do when most people have to work. To eat, you know, if most people don't have enough money to get by for, uh, and by or even money, just resources to get by for a week, if we only have a couple uh, insurance companies or not insurance companies, medical medical providers or drugs manufacturers, or places that are trying to uh, restrictions on hospitals or restrictions on medical schools, uh, you know, I was just reading in my last video on medical care. A couple people in the comments met, mentioned the Flexner report. The Flexner report was issued in 1910, and basically it was the Carnegie Foundation uh, that was basically saying we need to um, make product doctors more professional, which sounds great, but we uh, but that we should reduce the number of medical schools. And they reduced the number of medical schools by a huge a huge number, and they reduced the number of medical graduates by a huge numbers. They even specified. That uh, blacks shouldn't be doctors, and they um, canceled all but one of the black medical schools, um, and that—that's the whole point: is to reduce the supply of doctors. Well, Jesus, do we want a reduced supply of doctors? No. What? That is only good for doctors. So, I mean, you can look up the Flechner report, and you can read it. And this is highly—they they set limits on the number of medical schools in most states. It's just you can't have more than the state says. And in other states, it might not be a legal limit, but it's a, there's an association limit. So the schools that are already there can decide if there'll be another one, and they just don't let anyone else join. Um, bu -bu -bu. Trump, Hong Kong, Corona, and Uyghurs have 
brought America's attention to how bad the China is, but there are so many more scary bad things that China does that flies. In. Yeah, China is just the Uyghur stuff. Uh, you know, I've been hearing about that more. I've been in the last year. I wasn't by no means was I going to predict this, even though I knew that flus came from China and what and whatnot. Uh, but uh, the, the their the Jin the Jin regime has become much more heavy-handed and authoritarian. They always were, but they're becoming much more overt about it. The social credit system, um, the anti-foreign bias, um, the uh, dis dis the destruction of dissent. Uh, you know, I'm a big um, I'm not a big guy, but I, I'm a you know mostly you know I do jujitsu, and I started watching. There's um, uh, Xi Jin oh, no, not Xi Jinping. Who's the um, Xu Shaodong? There is an MMA fighter in China who goes around fighting kung fu masters, right? He says that kung fu doesn't work and it's it's not effective, and and so he goes and fights these um, tai chi masters, and um, he beats the shit out of all of them. Well, I don't see what this shouldn't be a big problem, but the Chinese Communist Party they're being very nationalist and they really pin like, oh no. Uh, Chinese martial arts are really effective and they're really great and they're the best form of self-defense and they're they're you know they want to say that their contribution to world society is is superior and greater than anybody else's and so um, you know a Wing Chun a Wing Chun expert is actually like a really tough guy and Xu Shaodong would beat the shit out of these guys and that seems you know if you're interested in fighting and fighting techniques that would be interesting but what's even more interesting is that the communist party hates him for this so they got rid of his social credit score they made it so that he can't travel he can't fly a plane he can't uh, you know like they they will allow him to fight but they will make him dress up like a clown uh, it's because he's he's they've kind of staked this nationalist claim on their traditional martial arts which are basically not very effective by and large and this guy is egg in their face, and so they're punishing him. I'm so, he'll probably die of coronavirus, to be honest. Uh, so, a lot of people are waking up to this, and they're and they're also really trying to force their censorship here. And you see that they've given money to the New York Times, who is then going back and expunging all the China talk and all their previous articles. Uh, they have control. They have censorship control uh, over Google and and YouTube, not control influence. That are, oh, and they, you know the fact that they go to like airlines and say, hey, when you list Taiwan, don't say Taiwan, say China Taipei. It has to be China. If you if you if you treat Taiwan like it's its own country, we're gonna right. So they're very very aggressive, and um, I think this is pissing everybody off about them. And it's just and also it's playing into Trump's hand, right? In a in a big way. And I think you know he's a blo a broken clock who's right twice. He has a lot of instincts that I think I don't agree with, but aren't necessarily completely foolish. And I think his skepticism of China is up there. And they 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 have become a lot worse over the last couple of years. Buh, buh, buh. When people say open borders, they don't mean open travel, but free and quick travel is the issue, not open and permanent immigration. Yeah, if people mean different things. I mean, like, what the left means is the left means welfare for anyone who wants to come here, uh, however, how, whatever, you know. Uh, and, I mean, really what the left is talking about is bringing in voters who are vote for the Democrats and using chain migration and whatnot. And um, that's why it's been opposed. I, th I feel like that's, if they want to do immigration reform after this, they'll have a big opportunity. Chloroquine is looking promising, though. You can easily get script on the mobile device. See, I've been hearing about chloroquine. It does look promising. How much is there going to be? How much is it, like, how effective is it? Are they prescribing it yet? Who knows? 70% uh, of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Yes, and having an, infl an inflationary monetary policy since 1917 or 1913 is a big part of that. That's a huge part of that, because if you are being paid in a deflationary medium, it would be in you would be incentivized to save. And you're not now because your money will lose value. And so you can't keep it in a bank. You have to tie it up. You have to try and put it in. You have to invest it. So this is very good for Wall Street and for speculation. It's been very bad for direct saving and frugality. And there's a good book on this by Guido Hussman called The Ethics of Money Production. And it is fascinating because hypothetically in terms of like doing economic calculations, if we're just talking about money as a medium of exchange, 
and, and doing calculus on it. It doesn't really matter what the inflation rate is or the deflation rate is if it's predictable, right? So let's say there was a 10% inflation per year. That would be okay if we knew, or like it would be, it would, it would be okay in terms of calculation if we just knew it was always going to be 10% every year. You could make your plans and be like, okay, we're spending all this money on a factory now. When we start selling goods in 18 months, this is how much we'll have to charge, accounting for the blah, 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 blah. You can make the case. Now, if it changes, if the value of money is fluctuating, then that becomes very difficult. So people like Milton Friedman were saying, you know, we should just have, I think he said 1%, maybe 2% per year. You know, and he said, we're not even going to call that inflation. That's just the baseline. You have other people who say, well, it just should never change. Holzman's book argument is that that's true, but there's also you have to understand that if you have inflation, it encourages people to spend and to have a high time preference. And if you have deflation, it encourages people to save and have a low time preference. And if we want to start talking about virtue and self-awareness and all this, deflation is better. You can still do the same calculus with deflation as you can do with inflation. Um, but it actually instills virtues that the other one doesn't. And I think there's a lot to that. If you knew that the money that you made at your job today would buy more next year than it buys this year, you would have a lower time preference. Boom. And that would be how you would save for retirement because the money that you made in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, if you save 10% of that when you're in 60s, 70s, and 80s, when the currency has deflated, you know, the fact that you made a dollar Every dollar that you you made when you were in your 20s could buy $5 worth of stuff when you're older. So that completely right there, and there's a, there's a hundred other reasons why it's fuck, fucked us up in, in, in how people save and whatnot. Um, even, even just having the government with welfare programs, and it's not, even people who don't receive them, they know that they could, right? If you know you can get unemployment, if you know that you're going to get social security, if you know that blah, 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 if you know you can get WIC, if you know you can do this, it creates moral hazard. And you'll be like, I don't have to be responsible for myself because the government's ultimately there. And that's just from day one, even if that's even for people who aren't trying to be lazy, who are trying to work, who are trying to do the right thing. But you think in the back of your head, I don't have to worry about this because they're out there. No. And again, it's not doesn't just have to be with you. I'm not saying everyone's a r radical individualist and can only be an atomist. No, you can have a family, you can have a friend, you can organize, you can join a co-op, you can join a home or whatever. You can have a group, you can form a clique and be like, hey, these are common problems that we foresee potentially happening. Let's organize in a way, let's make agreements that we will facilitate them. You know, let's all pitch in and we'll have a granary or we'll have a storehouse or a stockhouse or a fortress or a place that we can retreat or a farm or whatever it is. But if you think, well, there's a welfare program and the government's constantly saying they're going to take care of us, well, then you're just going to act completely differently. Oh, and by the way, the money you earn is going to buy less as time goes on. So you have to spend it. You can't save it. Uh do you think this will be the start of another Great Depression? No. So we're going to have a depression in the short term. It determines how long this lasts. Um, but even at the outside, it depends on a lot. Like if this if this virus becomes more deadly or it mutates where we keep getting hit like this, um, which seems unlikely, uh, it does seem like these tend to become less deadly over time. Uh, and just because this happened, you know, one bat gave it to somebody now, doesn't mean it's going to happen next year. Um, um, so, uh, where was I? Oh, so uh, the problem with the Great Depression was FDR. Okay, Freedom and Radio completely destroyed. Our economy for no no okay so F Franklin Delano Roosevelt is why the depression lasted so long for a number of reasons and you can look at some of the policies that he did were that were really counterproductive but the bottom line was he was kind of all over the map sometimes he would be pushing massive unionization and having all the unions and really uh, taxing the hell out of corporations and other times he was creating cartels and creating monopolies and creating corporate as special pleading and it, it was kind of all over the map. Whoever he was talking to, whatever he was feeling like in the moment, he would go with. Which, to be fair, is not that dissimilar from Donald Trump. 
that creates lots of problems though. And he all, but he did have an overall kind of an anti-business bent. So if you wanted to start a business or you were a business owner, if you had capital, if you had wealth, it did not make a lot of sense to start a factory and hire people because you never knew in a year and six months, FDR could pass a law that could destroy your opportunity. Okay. And, uh, and you just didn't know he, he talked when he would talk it, sometimes it sounded communist. Sometimes it sounded fascist. Some, you know, so the, the term here is regime uncertainty, and Robert Higgs has done a lot of really good books on this, Depression, War, and Cold War, probably most of all. Um, and the thing is, like, when he finally fucking died in 1945 in April, and then Harry Truman came to power, and Harry Truman had his faults and was no, like, free market guy, but he had kind of a consistent, we know what his point of view is. They undid a lot of regulations after the war because the war was over. Not all of them. There's a ratchet effect. They keep some of them always. And Robert Higgs's book, Crisis and Leviathan, covers that very well. And I've seen a lot of reason pieces recently talk about that. Um, uh, he, the fact that people could, you know, invest and start businesses and get back to work and be confident that it wasn't going to be confiscated from the government, that's what finally, or not necessarily confiscated, but regulated away or destroyed by some new newfangled policy that William Gompers or Henry Wallace or somebody convinced um, FDR to follow. Uh, and, you know, and he was basically a dictator. He was a four-term president, which has never happened before. He had a pliant, obedient Congress for most of that time. Um, you know, he was just too powerful to get whatever he wants. So it was just like, whoa, what do we do? I don't see that happening now. Okay, Trump is just too pro-business. He is kind of all over the place a little bit, but I don't. And the other thing is Trump wants to be popular. FDR wants to be powerful. And I'm not saying that to exonerate Trump, but I just don't see him as the type. Like, I think, A, he won't live that long. He's not going to be, a, he can't be a four-term president, so it won't last that long. Um, the only way it could become a Great Depression is if a really anti-business, if, if like Bernie Sanders became the president, which is not going to happen now. So, um Joe Biden is not going to destroy business, whatever his faults. I don't know if he's going to be alive when he runs for president. To be honest, he's disappeared for a week at this point. So that was what caused the Great Depression. I don't think that's likely to happen now, especially with Trump or any of the likely people to replace Trump. So, you know, if this takes, even if this takes 18 months, which by some estimates I've seen that it might, um, we are going to, um, people are going to want to work. There'll be demand. There'll be blah, blah, blah. I don't think it will lead to a hardcore depression. I could be wrong, but that's my feel. <sighs> uh, uh, I read his book, Movement of Diseases Like It's from Temporary Traveling, Not Becoming a Resident of foreign, uh, foreign National. Yeah, and that's, you know, are we talking about like closing the border and not allowing travel? Or are we talking about open immigration? Because when people say open borders, they are, they tend to mean like, immigration which are different things you don't have to be an immigrant to bring a disease so uh, da, da, da. price gouging because everyone's freaking out about why everyone's hoarding toilet paper and food yet complaining that there's nothing in the stores yeah so this is another uh, the market ignorance of the populace first of all a lot of it's unfair you'll see how many i'm sure you've all seen pictures and there's a little old lady hunched over and she's in an empty shelf shelf and they're like, look at all you selfish people who you don't know if that shelf was empty because of hoarders, man. Every single person before might have taken one sample and they still ran out, right? And so it wasn't necessarily a hoarder. Um, the other thing is, sorry, um, some people need it, man. Some people have families. Are you saying that like if you've, if you've got a wife and three kids that you should only buy one, one thing of rice? No. If you have any, if you're at all worried that there's going to be a supply problem or you're going to be quarantined, then it makes sense to prepare. And I'm sorry for people who didn't prepare earlier. And I think a lot of people will learn from this and not allow this to happen again. But, uh, and then yes, price gouging. People who are bringing stuff to consumers and getting paid high prices, those high prices tell other people, do this, bring more stuff. Oh my God, look how much you can make selling hand sanitizer. Fucking bring more hand sanitizer. This also happens after hurricanes. Where they they create sort like in places states like Florida they have laws where they declare a state of emergency and then all of a sudden there's price fixing and you can't raise the price. Well, since you can't raise the price, they run out of everything. They run out of gas. They run out of toilet paper. They run out of water. They run out of food, right? And it's and it is it's a hectic situation. But if you could charge whatever you wanted, 
well, you can't charge too much because people won't buy it, but you can charge enough to give it an incentive for people to start coming and bringing supplies, bringing supplies. Do you not want that? Do you want an incentive for people to bring the supplies? Do you want an incentive for people to make the supplies? So the two things the government needs to do is not regulate the production and not penalize the distribution and the sale. And so, yeah, you're basically telling people who are desperate for these things are saying, we don't want there to be an incentive for there to be more of these things. No, you do want there to be incentive for more of these things. This is a classic what Kaplan, since he came up with the comments, talks about an anti-market bias. This is just easy, easy economics. And, you know, I can I understand it, it does appear to go against many people's intuitions. But Christ, man, I have friends who have family. I'm not going to feel bad if they go and they take three things of to toilet paper or four things of toilet paper. And we don't even know that that's what's happening, right? People could be taking one at a time. And if a store doesn't want to, if a store wants to have a policy where it's one each, which many stores do, even when there isn't a pandemic, many stores do that. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Chloroquine is the cure, but will the FDA change its label? The FDA will say we need to develop our own chloroquine, and it will be ready in five years. We'll expedite it. We'll take half the time as normal. Three separate studies have shown 100% recovery in three to six days, chloroquine. If that's true, then somebody, somebody is making a lot of chloroquine. Uh, Fujita, Austrian, using the term inflation wrong. No, inflation means you increase the money supply. Boom, doesn't mean prices go up. People use the term inflation incorrectly all the time. If you were looking to move to Europe, where would you go? Switzerland? If I could just pick. Well, Iceland, Switzerland, and uh, maybe Poland. Biden will be another Woodrow Wilson. And by that, you mean somebody who's not really in charge and being ruled by other people. It already seems like that's going on. People are already criticizing his campaign and have been for a while for like touting around an old man who doesn't know what's up. The guy is clearly losing his marbles. He's still missing. Uh, he's been gone for like, like a week or a couple weeks. So, you know, I think Trump is going to, there's going to be a lot of rallying around Trump unless he screws up big time. And I think he's too savvy to do that, really. Um, you know, I think, just think that he's going to walk away with this. Yeah, okay, so I don't know maybe how what I sounded or didn't sound like ANCAP, but prices going up is not inflation. But the increase in the money supply is inflation. However, increasing the money supply will usually cause prices to go up, although not evenly. It depends where the money is getting stolen or getting spent most but uh, and supply and all that stuff. But uh, an increase in the money supply is inflation. People actually do debate this, right? You can get a systematic argument what should be inflation, what shouldn't be the inflation. Uh oh. Do I think Biden got sick? Well, everyone else is getting sick, so it's totally plausible. I've also heard, though, I mean, I remember back in the New Hampshire primary, my man on the inside uh, told me that, you know, Biden, his tour bus has a big bed in it and he sleeps in it all the time and that he really can't campaign very much. So, I mean, he literally is not getting up very early. He can only campaign a little bit. Um, Sanders even pointed this out before he dropped out that he, most of his public speaking, he, he does for like seven minutes, eight minutes. He does just does not seem like he is vigorous enough to do more than that. So he's clearly physically and mentally declining. Uh, his staff probably knows this, and they're just kind of sheltering him around. Uh, I, you wonder if any of them like have a serious conversation like hey should this guy be president but i think they just assume if he gets elected they'll be elevated and that's all they really care about and he's become he's a vehicle for their advancement i was thinking prague czechoslovakia seems to have lower taxes than switzerland and my Czech friends say i can keep my ar-15 well i think you can keep it in switzerland too 
That's probably not a bad choice, though. It's, you know, those post-communist states sometimes have really strong anti-communist roots, which I can always get on board with, which is one reason I said Poland. So, I don't know. What do you guys think? Any other thoughts? Libertarian, anti libertarian? Very Zionist. Biden would be more LBJ, very Zionist. They've all been very Zionist. Trump is very Zionist. I mean, Biden's big virtue is that he's very meh and nobody feels strongly about it. You know, Hillary was widely hated, you know, for good reason. And even though he's policy wise very similar to her, he just doesn't. He just doesn't generate the same um, rigorous disapproval. What are the most pro-gun countries outside the USA? Uh, so I'm going to get this wrong, but I think Ur one of the South American states, I think Uruguay maybe, um, is pretty pro-gun. Uh, obviously, you have states that just have failed states and whatever. So Somalia or Afghanistan, probably pretty pro-gun in practice. Kyrgyzstan, I think also. Um, and then uh, some of the Scandinavian countries, so Finland is pretty good, Sweden's okay, Iceland's okay. Um, they don't allow handguns in Iceland, otherwise it's pretty okay. Um, Switzerland is a very mixed, so they definitely, I mean, people are famously, like, everyone's in the militia, and, you, and people who are in the militia have to have a gun, but the gun is owned by the state and kind of heavily regulated, and you can't open carry, and... So they, they have a gun culture, but it's more of a civic duty kind of thing. I mean, obviously there are people in Switzerland who are into it and whatnot, but it's not not really analogous to the United States. And also Canada is not particularly bad um, relative to other Western European states. New Zealand used to be pretty good. That's now obviously going to change. Australia used to be pretty good before 1996, at least especially in Tasmania. Um, don't know. I mean, Mozambique has an AK-47 on their flag, so that's probably not too bad. Um, other than that, I mean, other countries in Europe, Germany's not the worst. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these states will allow you to own things like long rifles for the, uh, ostensibly for hunting or for target shooting. But the big difference is it's kind of unusual to have a state that allows you to concealed carry for self-defense. Uh, I think you can. Czech Republic is one you can though. Um, so yeah, it varies, I've, but I've, I'm probably misremembering this, but I'm thinking it's either Paraguay or Uruguay. I think it's Uruguay though is pretty good in South America. What have you been doing without the gym? I've been doing pull-ups and a lot of bodyweight exercises. So I don't really have a way to do pull-ups, but I do have home gym stuff. I have dumbbells. Um, I have trip, um, dip bars. Uh, and yeah, just push ups and sit ups, and I went on a diet. And uh, you know, I probably should have gone on a diet anyway, so it's fine. There's not a lot else to do, so it's, it's actually like being more consistent with my attendance, to be honest. So, I do think the people who are declaring the death of libertarianism are just people who hate libertarianism and anyway. And to say, and Trump is doing some very unlibertarian things, absolutely, but he doesn't identify as libertarian and never has. Uh, and governments don't identify, like governments have been doing unlibertarian things all along. So the idea that like this is some radical break, um, I guess a lot of people like to pretend like Republicans are libertarians, but they don't even really pretend that. And um, yeah, so. Oh, great. A horn. So, all right, guys, we're going up in an hour. Any final questions? 100 burpees a day. Yeah, so I'm not doing, I don't, I don't want to do burpees because I, I would actually hit the ceiling. So I, but I'm doing squats every day, uh, body weight squats or with dumbbells. I actually have a bar, but it's, it's like one of those funny looking curl bars. 
<laughs> don't go on a diet, team thick. Uh, well, I don't need a thick waistline to be thick. Do, 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 do. Today's the 22nd. Don't go on a diet, team thick. I'm going to break my diet a little bit because my birthday's coming up, but uh, after that, I'll be right back. So. Do, do, do. Do you have any thoughts on Singapore? An interesting mix of pro-business and socialism, but it seems like they have an effective deal with Corona. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, because testing so so hard, it's just hard to know for sure. And there's so many other variables that we don't understand. How much does climate affect it, if any? How much does ethnicity affect it, if any? How much does you know? There's a lot we don't know. Uh, Singapore is kind of how do you rate uh, economic freedom? It's usually rates rated pretty high, but uh, they're also pretty authoritarian, so you can get cane in the ass or whatever. So uh, there, there are types of authoritarianism where you leave a lot to the market. You just don't allow political freedom, um, and those I think those are kind of the most dangerous types of regimes because they have the most wealth, then uh, they have the most prosperity, so their populations are going to be more pliant. And as long as they're not so oppressive that they upset everybody, um, they'll be okay. And like China has kind of flirted this line, but I think that they're getting to the point where they risk, risk, I'm not saying this will happen, but risk pissing their people off too much. Um, Singapore seems to be on the, on the safer side of that. Um, so, yeah, I just, I don't, I wonder... I wonder two things about the um, the authoritarian response to a pandemic like this. How much does it help? It seems like hypothetically it might be able to help, but also might be able to make it worse. The thing, the thing that you're kind of you have to assume that the authoritarian power will act wisely, or at least as well as anyone else could. And the thing is, we've seen, like in the case of China, they didn't do that. It looks like that's also happening in Russia, where they're denying this is a problem in Russia, but it seems like it actually is. They're denying this is, you know, China says they have no new cases, and then actually they probably have many, 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 many more new cases. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you can have an authoritarian state and say, well, we're doing this because we assume that it will take care of a pandemic well. The other thing is, what happens when there's not a pandemic? You're still left with this paying this bill all the time. Um, and is a is a 5% pandemic once every hundred years worth an authoritarian regime the entire time. Now I think if the answer was the pandemic is going to kill everybody and this is the only way to stop it, then yes, but how likely is that? Um, so boo, boo, boo. What do you think about the metals-backed debt accounts? I'm not familiar with the man cap, so I cannot give you an informed opinion about them. And are transaction fees worth it at this point? Again, I don't know. Um, people who are kind of trading between gold and silver, you kind of got to do it when the price is right. And I don't follow it close enough. You know, I, I'm not a, a trader in metals. You know, I, I have some that I, I as savings, but I don't keep track of them that, that closely, so I don't know. Uh, I remember a video a long time ago saying you don't ever drink because that's still true. That's always been true. I've never drank in my life. Uh, never had a drop. Not at any point. Never felt the desire to. Never regretted making that choice. It's definitely saved me a lot of money and a headache and time and probably a couple inches on my waistline. And my mind. And my liver, probably. Do, do, do. All right, coming up on nine o'clock. So we got three, four minutes, and then I'm gonna call it quits because my restoration device just popped off, and I want to get it back on. So priorities, people. I've heard there have been some weird things with the um, 
ratio between gold and silver that it's the ratio is now something that hasn't been in like 5,000 years that spot prices aren't changing but like futures prices are changing so I don't know there's a lot there's a lot of theories about what happens with metals that I I will be honest to say I don't really know um, Private borders solve all the government issues. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely, if you had a private road or a private airport, you could see them saying, hey, you know, ever, we don't allow people to fly in these if they're sick, uh, you know, uh, or not a safe driver or whatever else. Um, yeah. How's your prepper inventory look? Oh, hey, John Bragg, long time no speak. Um, I'm not full blown prepper, but you know, I'm like a I'm like a half prepper. And it's okay. I'm just used to you know, from the oil field stuff, I'm used to going months at a time without like going anywhere and having to have food for that long. 122 to 1. Dude, that's nuts. Cause I believe in nature it's like 70 to 1. So Oh no. Uh, so obviously I'm against bailouts if a company just goes out of business. It's different when the government tells you you have to stop working. If the government says your business has to close, which they have done, I, I mean, it's ethically it doesn't make sense for them not to pair. Now, I understand the economic consequences of that. Now, with the case of the airline or something like if this was just a pandemic, but we had a free market, I wouldn't really worry The the airlines would go bankrupt. That's fine. It wouldn't be like we wouldn't have any air travel. That would just be picked up by new owners, and new entrepreneurs when it picked up again. Um, but to the degree that the airlines have had to close because of government action, are they entitled to restitution for that? You know? 19 or oh, 20 okay I thought it was 70 uh, du, du, du. so let's see yeah, I coughed. I'm sorry. Maybe I have coronavirus. I am feeling a little, a little bit of a fever. So, uh, but oh, and it is nine o'clock. So I want to thank you all guys for watching, and uh, everyone stay safe, stay isolated. I hope you're enjoying your time alone. I hope you have a way to keep, uh, keep interested and find a way to like keep uh, 